Spores drop, mycelium runs, mushrooms fruit, and spores drop again. It's obviously a little more complicated than that, but those six words describe what is known as the mushroom life cycle. A process of birth, life, death, and rebirth shared by all mushrooms across the globe. Understanding this mushroom life cycle is key to understanding our fungal allies. Whether you're interested in hunting them in the wild, growing them, or even just using them as a supplement. In this video, I'm going to do a broad overview of the mushroom life cycle and explain why it matters. By definition, the mushroom life cycle doesn't really have a beginning or an end. But since we have to start somewhere, I think it makes sense to start with spores. Spores are one of the most unique and interesting aspects of mushrooms in general. Much like plants have seeds, which are cool, I guess, but they're definitely not as cool as spores. Mushroom spores vary quite widely in both size and shape, but generally they are quite small. So small that they float around in the air all around you, and they're not even really noticeable unless they assemble in large quantities. And they definitely can be produced in massive quantities. Mushroom fruiting bodies can produce millions, even billions of spores. A really good example of this is on a reishi farm, for example, where spores are actually purposefully cultivated because the spores of the reishi mushroom actually do contain some medicinal benefits. And on a reishi mushroom farm, if you leave it long enough, the spores will collect on top of the fruiting body up to like an inch deep. It's just crazy to imagine how many spores are coming out of the single reishi mushroom fruiting body. Lion's mane mushroom will produce a lot of spores as well. Quite often when you're growing, if you leave them long enough, the spores will come out of the tooth of the lion's mane mushroom and just cover the bottom of your fruiting area. Another really good example of spores being produced in massive quantities is when you're growing oyster mushrooms. Oyster mushrooms in particular are known for producing massive amounts of spores, and sometimes they will even produce so many spores that will actually clog the exhaust fans in the growing room. Because the spores can be different colors, they're also commonly used for identification purposes. Some spores can be white, like lion's mane or oysters, or some spores can be even pink, like the pink oyster. Some spores can be dark purple or even black, like in a lot of psilocybe species. And some spores can even be green, like in the poisonous green spore Leviota. But the real job of spores is to carry the genetic information required to grow the mushroom. Interestingly though, a single spore does not contain all of the data required to actually grow the mushroom. Spores are haploid, which means an individual spore only contains one half of the genetic information required. Luckily though, since mushroom fruiting bodies produce so many spores, there are lots of spores that each contain half of the genetic information required to grow the mushroom, and eventually, as we'll talk about in the next step, to become one. So spores float through the air, perhaps they get carried around by an animal, or perhaps they even get carried in an animal, but either way they get around. So imagine that this red marker is a spore with half the genetic material, and this blue one is a spore with the other half the genetic material. So they're floating around in the air, or getting around, carried by an animal, whatever. Eventually the spores will find a nice spot that's maybe warm, maybe moist, the perfect conditions for it to germinate. And you can think of the germination much the same as a seed of a plant will germinate. So eventually it will produce these little threads that are kind of single cells. And this is called hyphae. So this is maybe one version, we'll call it the positive hyphae. And this other one from the spore, we'll call that the negative one, same the hyphae, but this one contains half the genetic material, this contains the other half the genetic information. But eventually, two compatible hyphae will meet, and it will form mycelium. This newly formed mycelium essentially creates a brand new strain, a new strain of mushrooms that might have different characteristics. This is why when you're growing mushrooms from spores, it's kind of a total crapshoot because the different strains can have different characteristics, like maybe one is faster to fruit, maybe one produces larger fruiting bodies, all sorts of different characteristics that mushrooms can have depending on the random combinations of two different spores creating this new strain of mycelium. Either way, this new strain of mushrooms that was created by the combination of two different hyphae will start growing much faster, much more vigorously, and will form a thick mycelial mat. Mycelium grows by excreting compounds that help to eat and use the organic material around it. You can kind of think of it like an inverted digestive system. Mycelium is super tenacious, absolutely devouring all the organic material around it, and it grows fast and furiously. When cultivating mushrooms, mycelium grows until it reaches the end of the cropping 
shipping container or the end of the substrate or nutrition. Like in a jar of myceliated grain, for example, it will just continue to grow until it completely devours all of the grain inside the jar and consolidates it into one solid mass. When it grows in nature, it will continue to grow until it encounters some sort of competition from another fungi or until it just runs out of nutrients. And it can get really big. Some mycelial mats can be absolutely gargantuan, like the honey fungus in Oregon, for example. This honey fungus is quite literally the largest organism in the entire world, and the mycelial mat is the size of multiple football fields. That is wild stuff. When cultivating mushrooms, mushroom growers essentially mimic this natural process. Strains are selected from the wild, perfected in the lab, and then put through a series of mycelial expansions. Usually it starts with an agar plate, which is then put on a sterilized grain, which is then put into a substrate like hardwood or compost, and eventually that is used to fruit the mushroom, which would be ready for harvest. Mushrooms in nature did it first and do it best, but cultivators have still done a pretty good job of mimicking the process reliably. Once the mycelium has reached the edge of its substrate, it will stop, take a breather, consolidate all of its resources, and get ready for the big event fruiting. Now this fruiting process is often triggered by external environmental conditions. You can think of the weather getting cooler in the fall or a period of heavy rain. First, certain areas of the mycelial mat will consolidate into tiny little knots, which will eventually get a little bigger and turn into what we call mushroom pins. If the conditions are right, meaning there's a high enough amount of humidity and there's enough fresh air, these pins will continue to grow at a super rapid pace, pushing all of the energy and nutrients from the mycelial mat into something we call the fruiting body. Of course, the fruiting body can look vastly different depending on the species of mushroom. A button mushroom is different from a lion's mane, is different from a reishi, but they are all serving essentially the same purpose, which is a structure that can create more spores and start the whole life cycle over again. Fruiting bodies in general are ephemeral, and for some species they only last a few short beautiful days. Fruiting bodies are affected by all sorts of different things like light, the amount of fresh air, even by gravity, and in general they will grow to give themselves the best chance for the widest spore dispersal. And that is why specific conditions like fresh air and light can have such a profound effect on the shape and the look of the mushroom fruiting body. For example, if anyone's tried to grow oyster mushrooms indoors, they'll see that they have really long stems and tiny little caps, and that is because the mushroom thinks it's not in a very high fresh air environment, so it will continue to grow until it finds that. That. And this is reminiscent of oyster mushrooms growing out of the bark of a tree and it will try to find the part of the environment that has the most fresh air so that it does finally disperse its spores, they will be put into the wind and dispersed widely. Now you may look at this mushroom life cycle, see how mushrooms grow in the wild and be confused as to why mushrooms are so hard to grow at home. If mushrooms can just do this in nature, then why do we have to be so ridiculously sterile when we're trying to grow mushrooms? Well the answer is that mushrooms Mushrooms are growing outdoors in nature with essentially what is a shotgun approach. Nature is more balanced in terms of competition, but the vast majority of spores that are floating through the air do not result in a new mushroom strain or a new colony of mushrooms. When we're trying to cultivate mushrooms, we're trying to force this process into a very specific time and a very specific place. We create the perfect environment for growing mushrooms, like something that's moist and high in nutrition, but at the same time, that creates the perfect growing environment for competing molds like trichoderma or certain bacteria. If these contaminants get a chance to infect our perfect environment, there's a very good chance that the faster growing contaminants will eventually outcompete our mushroom mycelium. However, if we ensure that it's only mushroom mycelium in this very highly nutritious environment and no contaminants are present by using sterile technique, then there's a way better chance that the mushrooms will have a chance to flourish. So that's it. The mushroom life cycle is really one of the greatest achievements of the natural world. Although we have figured out how to mimic this life cycle and grow mushrooms at scale, nature still does it best. So next time you're walking in the woods and see a mushroom, you can think about all the things that it took to get there and the endless cycles that will come afterwards. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Do you want to become a functional mushroom expert? I've got just the thing for you. It's a new ebook called Mushroom Powered, the history, the science, and the benefits of the world's most fantastic fungi. At over 130 pages, it's absolutely packed 
with all the information you need to know to learn about the world's most powerful medicinal mushrooms. And the best part, it's 100% free. You can download it right now, just click the link in the description, enter your email address, and I will send it to you right away. I hope you love it.